I haven't met you yet, I'm Adam Jar. I am the founder of View Mastery. We are the ultimate learning platform with a whole website devoted to learning and mastering Vue.js. <clears throat> Currently, we have just over 50 courses that either start you from the beginning or deepen your knowledge with more advanced content. So today, the topic of my talk is called Rendering Revealed, because as you're building a new web app, you have a crucial question to answer, and that's how is my app going to be rendered? Is it going to be rendered more on the server side, or alternatively, is it going to be on the client side, or is it going to be some sort of combination of both? But with all the choices that are available to us, there's SSR, SSG, SVA, what do these even mean? How do they differ? How are they similar? And ultimately, what is the best choice for you? So that's what we're gonna uh, hopefully gain some clarity on by the end of this talk, and also set some groundwork for some future talks throughout today and tomorrow. In order to get this clarity, we're gonna take a brief history uh, through the uh, history of web rendering to see where we came from so that we can better understand where we are now and how we got here. So we're gonna go way back in time to the year 1990. Why then? That's around the year that people started to get personal computers at home. And if you were a millennial like me, you might've been using Microsoft Paint to make beautifully pixelated art on your computer or maybe playing beautifully pixelated games like Ski Free. Any, any Ski Free uh, fans in the audience? Awesome. Not the only one with that little memory nugget. <laughs> but soon uh, we were off of our actual, you know, local environments and we were surfing the web. So without realizing it, Around the year 1994, there was some popular uh, GeoCities uh, sites, and, and we, you know, for probably uh, most of us uh, on the younger side back then, we didn't realize that we were actually engaging with our first kind of rendering mode that we're going to take a look at, and that is a static site. So now at their core, static sites, uh, they still exist. Um, at the time, they were very simple sites containing fixed HTML, and they're a lot different now, but um, really they serve a simple purpose. They're great for sites that have unchanging uh, data. Maybe it's a restaurant site with an address, phone number, menu, hours, those kinds of things. But of course, they're not ideal for websites that need to be dynamic and where the site needs to be interactive or personalized based on your user and, and how they need to be using the app. So as the web quickly evolved, we no longer needed to leave the house for simple things like buying books. Because in 1995, we had the advent of Amazon.com. If you were like me, you were ordering uh, or reading, uh, you know, Animorphs and Goosebumps. Any, any, any Goosebumps R.L. Stein fans in the audience? Okay, I see a couple of you comrades. All right, cool. So this was our first major large-scale introduction to an MPA. Now, an MPA stands for a multi-page application. As it sounds, it consists of multiple pages, each of which are going to be accessible by their own URL. And then navigating between those pages on the site meant you were triggering a full page reload because it was fetching that from the server. So looking at that, a little more specifically, as we visited those pages, that meant we were requesting that data from the server. Server would render it on the fly. In the context of early Amazon, that meant the server would cook up that page with the image, description, title of the book, etc. And then when it had that all cooked up for us, <clears throat> it would send it back and render it in the client. Now, because each page is rendered on the server, that meant that it could have its own metadata, which was very SEO friendly and still is for, for MPAs. And they offered a clear navigation experience for the user. So you could predictably, uh, uh, you know, you have a dedicated page for a book and people are, have a very clear understanding of how the website works. So things aren't really happening in an unexpected, unintuitive way. 
But since every page request did involve that round trip to and from the server, that meant that there could be performance issues and uh, navigation delays as well, and ultimately could lead to some headaches for managing state across those different page reloads. With all this in mind, some scenarios where an MPA might be well suited still are large e-commerce sites with a wide inventory of products, maybe a real estate or job listing site, specifically where there's uh, different entry points that users might enter in from. You could use an MPA for an administrative site that offers a wide range of services under different uh, kind of topic domains. And there's a whole uh, range of applications for an SPA. Back on our timeline, as we move forward in time, in 2001, Wikipedia was launched. And this is a perfect example of a classic MPA where there's a dedicated page for every topic under the sun. And this rendering strategy was going strong for bigger sites. And it really wasn't until uh, 2004 when we saw Gmail uh, have an, in, uh, an innovative rendering strategy with the SPA. Now with Gmail and the SPA uh, setup, they showcase the potential of creating dynamic, responsive, and really highly interactive web pages. And this was through the use of JavaScript to handle the UI rendering and the client side app logic. They were using Ajax for fetching data in the background. And this eliminated the need for this full page reloads. And it allowed the user to receive real-time updates and navigate seamlessly around the app, all while maintaining the application state within the client. Now, the introduction of this SPA architecture it was timely because soon thereafter, in around 2008, we saw the introduction of the iPhone as well as Android and their respective app stores. And this really catalyzed the mobile app revolution where there, you know, there's an app for that and the, there was more seamless interactions with more fluid animations within uh, the UIs. There's instant feedback with stateful interactions. We had less loading delays within these apps. And this really set a new standard for what our users of uh, technology started to expect from their digital experiences. So it wasn't a coincidence that in 2019, excuse me, 2009, Twitter transitioned from an MPA to an SVA. And this enhanced their user experience with a more dynamic interface. Now, taking a closer look at how an SPA functions is key to understand what is meant by the single page in the single page application terminology. Typically, uh, we're referring to the index.html file. That's the app's entry point. It's going to load all the resources. And this is where everything is loaded and rendered and uh, it allows us to achieve client side navigation inside of that single page. And so we're able to get that more fluid, kind of more mobile-like experience that we had a, been accustomed to with these mobile apps in iOS and, and Android. But SPAs are not without their downsides because browsers are going to have to download that entire uh, JavaScript bundle. So you go to the page and there might be a delay until all those files are downloaded. And this could lead to some damage to your performance scores, uh, particularly your CLS and your LCP. And if a user is on a maybe a less powerful device or a slower connection, I just had, I live in a rural area and I had Wi-Fi issues all this week. And so I have newfound empathy for people with, um, is, you know, struggle with very low megabytes. Uh, and so if, a user is trying to access your site and they're trying to load those files, um, it might take a bit longer than, than you'd, you'd hope for, for the uh, user to wait. This could also result in poor SEO because with everything rendered on the client, then your pages can't be crawled and indexed. And um, also there is not the ability to do social sharing content previews. But understanding their pros and cons, SVAs are particularly well suited for applications where a dynamic user interface uh, is useful 
where immediate feedback is essential. So maybe a dashboard, analytics tools, certain kinds of uh, social networks, and uh, interactive productivity apps could work well as an SPA. Now, as the use cases for SPAs expanded, we saw the introduction of SPA for, uh, frameworks such as Angular. This, of course, was developed by Google in 2010 that was released. And this was followed up soon by Facebook in 2013 with React.js. And pretty immediately, we saw major platforms like Instagram, Airbnb, and uh, Netflix adopting the React library. And as uh, Evan just uh, referenced uh, not too long ago, 10 years ago, as of this past February, uh, he released Vue.js. And this was rapidly adopted by major sites of its own, like Alibaba, Xiaomi, and later GitLab. While well, these frameworks were and definitely still are enormously impactful, there was an increasing demand for faster loading SEO optimized sites, along with a more efficient developer experience for building larger, more complex applications. And this all spurred the development of meta frameworks like Next for uh, React in 2018, as well as Nuxt for Vue. Now, these uh, meta frameworks, they sit on top of and supplement their underlying frameworks, and they help uh, the developer uh, by automating away some common tasks, um, uh, take care of some boilerplate for us, and provide built-in performance optimizations and rendering mode options as well. If we take a deeper look specifically into the Nuxt rendering modes that are possible, so we can still create an SVA technically with uh, Nuxt and get performance benefits, as well as file-based routing and uh, boilerplate taken care of uh, just out of the box for us. Um, but really a common reason developers choose Nuxt is to overcome challenges related to SEO and performance as well. And they do this by leveraging the built-in support for alternative rendering modes like SSR, server-side rendering. Now with SSR, the browser is going to request a web page from the server. The server is going to build that page, including fetching any of its required data. And then it's going to send that fully rendered HTML back to the browser along with the JavaScript bundle that contains all the necessary logic for the uh, app. And then uh, once received by the client, then uh, the process of hydration occurs. And this is really... Um, when essentially the JavaScript is executed, event handlers are attached, and the page becomes fully interactive for the user. So things like button clicks, form submissions, and page transitions, those all start working with the hydration step. So in essence, it's, it's the step that transforms the server-rendered static page into the dynamic application that the user can engage with in the browser. And we call this universal, uh, a universal app, also known as isomorphic, because technically it lives on both sides of uh, the server client paradigm. Because you can move dependencies and data fetching to the server, this allows you to achieve a faster initial page load than you otherwise would with uh, an SBA. Um, you can also have improved performance scores and an overall smaller client side JavaScript bundle size. And really crucially, search engines can effectively crawl and index your pages because they're living on the server and that's going to vastly improve the SEO of your site while also making social sharing previews possible. Now SSR is going to shine in scenarios that uh, real-time content is key. So for example, a breaking news site uh, if it's using SSR, it's going to be guaranteed to serve the latest published news to the visitors who show up on the site. A live sports site can be delivering the scores so that the action on the screen matches what you're seeing on um, your TV. And um, ultimately, for better or worse, online shopping these days is not just about anonymously browsing products anymore. We have a much more tailored shopping experience where we're showing suggestions and whatnot to the user based on 
what we believe that they might be interested in. And so an SSR could help us achieve that uh, kind of functionality. But what if your site doesn't need to be so interactive or personalized for your user? Uh, there are cases where um, you might want to use an alternative rendering mode that Nux allows us to achieve, such as SSG or static site generation. Now, as it sounds, this is going to mean that your site is statically generated. So it allows us to pre-build all the pages of our website into static uh, HTML files. And then through a command <clears throat> like Nux generate, we essentially take those files and translate those into uh, static pages. And those pre-rendered pages can then be deployed really to any web server or, or hosting service capable of serving static assets. Uh, including CDNs, and then you're going to benefit from their global distribution and performance optimizations as well. So that when a, at request time, those pre-built pages are sent directly to the browser and there's no need for real-time page generation, and that's going to ensure fast load times and improve performance. There is, of course, a drawback to um, statically generating a site if you have a large site with many pages. So um, you could incur very long build uh, times. If you have, for example, a new site with just thousands of pages of articles, you really wouldn't want to wait um, hours to be building all of those pages to push your latest breaking news. That just wouldn't work for your use case. So you have to be mindful of um, maybe this isn't the best use case if brief build time is important for you. So with that in mind, an SSG could be well suited for static sites like portfolios, landing pages, marketing pages, documentation sites, um, blog and content sites, things like that where the content doesn't need to be changing so often and, and the timeliness does, of the build and deployment is not so crucial. So touring these rendering modes, you might, uh, you might be wondering, if uh, you have certain pages, maybe that would work well as an SPA, but other pages might work better as SSR or SSG. Uh, is there some sort of combination that you can do? Fortunately, with Nux 3, we can actually implement hybrid rendering modes. And this essentially means that we can have different caching routes, uh, caching rules per route. And uh, one such hybrid caching mode is known as SWR, or stale while revalidate. This is not a uh, Nuxt exclusive uh, term or concept, but it's available within Nuxt.js. And you can kind of think of this as SSG on demand, essentially. So when a user visits a page for the first time, that page is going to be built and then sent back while simultaneously uh, being stored in the cache, essentially a copy of it stored in the cache, so that um, that page can then be automatically sent uh, upon the next time it's visited. And uh, within Nux, there's two different ways specifically of implementing SWR, and that is with or without a TTL or time to live set. And so essentially how that works is uh, without a TTL, Nux is going to save the API response that was used for generating the first version of the page. And then on the next page visit, that cached HTML is sent. And then only the API is uh, going to be called on those subsequent requests. So that when a change is detected during a request, the server is going to return uh, the stale response and then generate the new HTML in the background, which will then be served for the next response. So that was without a TTL. If we do set a TTL or time to live, what we're doing is we're essentially programming a timer that is going to count down and then reset the cache after the duration that we set. So uh, when the timer is up, the page then is regenerated and cached in the background. In addition to SWR, we have a similar hybrid rendering approach called incremental static regeneration. You might also see it in the wild uh, as incremental static generation, two different terms for the same thing. In uh, Nuxt, it's, it's the regeneration, so the acronym is going to be ISR. 
And this uh, is uh, essentially the rendering and caching behavior here is very similar, like I said, to SWR, except we are able to add the response to, the, uh, to a CDN cache. So without a TTL set, the content is going to persist until the next deployment inside that CDN. But it's, uh, at, at least at, at this point, things are, of course, evolve uh, all the time. But at this point, that this behavior that we're looking at is only available on the platforms that support it, which are going to be Netlify and Vercel at this very moment. With ISR and a TTL set, you're uh, essentially the response is cached on a CDN for a set duration and then regenerated in the background at the interval that you set and then replace, uh, it's replaced in the cache. Cool. So now that we have an understanding of the kind of more traditional rendering modes, the hybrid rendering modes. Let's look at how we might set up a route rule based rendering strategy for a Nuxt app. So let's say we have a home page that we want to be statically generated as an SSG. Our admin dashboard, we want to function as an SPA. And then we have a blog that we want to function as an ISR. So how we would set that up is we'd go into our Nux config file, and then we can set up route rules to achieve this. So the pre-render true here that you're seeing, this is going to set up our home page to be pre-rendered at build time. And then SSR false is the terminology we use to essentially say, don't do any SSR. In other words, leave it uh, uh, and make it an SPA. And then ISR. 3600. This is going to inform the page to be generated on demand and then regenerated at every hour. Of course, that 3600 is yours to configure uh, in terms of the duration that you want to set. It's also important to note here that if you want to um, essentially do this hybrid approach, then you cannot use that Nux generate command like I showed you earlier. That is for exclusively building your entire site as an SSG. Um, so you either build your entire site as such, or you do it with these route rules and you make certain rules statically generated, uh, certain routes rather statically generated while others uh, are not. Okay, so we've looked at mostly the context of these rendering modes within Nuxt. Of course, this is a view conference, so that's the most relevant, but I find that it's helpful to compare against other frameworks to get a little more grounded in how uh, these things that we're working with compare with other things out in the wild and that maybe we might work with at another job or that our friends are working on. So if we look at Next.js, we'll see that it essentially has the same rendering modes um, that uh, I alluded to before. The uh, difference is the implementation details are going to vary slightly. And when we look at it like this, we're really talking about Next.js in the pages router version. In Next.js 13, there was the um, release of the app router. And this meant that these rendering options, while they're still possible, they're simplified under either server components or client components. So it's really a simplification of, of concept. And so if you added use client to the top of a component file within Next.js, this is going to put that into a client only or SBA mode. Whereas with the server components, that's actually going to be the default mode. And uh, those essentially are going to be the, the rendering strategy for those files are going to be automatically uh, chosen uh, by default uh, based upon things like the functions within them. Maybe it has git server side props for real time data or uh, git uh, static props for uh, pre built pages. Within Next, you can leverage client components for the parts of your UI that need to be interactive or which rely on things like state lifecycle hooks, browser APIs, or uh, the React class components. And then the remaining components can all be server components. 
And then if you're using the suspense component, that's going to enable a process called streaming, where you're essentially progressively sent chunks from the server, and those are made live and accessible in the UI as they're available. And this allows the user to interact with parts of the page before the entire page is ready. So it uh, essentially makes it uh, interactive sooner without waiting for everything to be ready. Now this component-based rendering strategy it's going to be uh, similar to a newer framework that came onto the scene uh, in 2001, and that is Astro. It's technically a framework, but I'm calling it a neo framework here specifically because of its unique ability to be composed of uh, components and a combination of components, really, if you wanted to, of all the major modern J JavaScript frameworks that are out there. And this really helped popularize the idea of what's called islands architecture, where only certain sections of your app are going to receive JavaScript hydration. Like I mentioned, you can compose these Astro apps with components from various major frameworks. And then you essentially have really granular control with these client directives on how those components are going to be hydrated on the page. But Astro is not the only framework that's using this uh, islands concept, because uh, Nuxt is uh, exploring in an experimental way currently the Nuxt island component. And um, it essentially allows us to achieve that island scoping of hydration. But um, it's inverted here, where the non-interactive parts of your page are going to be um, the, the islands themselves. So I, I think that actually conceptually makes more sense because the islands are dry, they're sandy, they're you know, not wet, whereas everything else, that's the water, that's the sea, that's being hydrated. So if we pull way back out and look at the main kind of bird's eye view of where JavaScript uh, and web rendering is, the major takeaways is it has moved toward and continues to move toward really fine-tuned granular hydration where the goal is to ship less JavaScript to, to the client um, for all those uh, benefits that you would have in terms of faster load times, better performance, etc. So now that we're inundated with all this knowledge about the different rendering modes, how do you actually choose the best one for you? You might have an intuitive sense based on everything we covered so far, but a decent approach is to ask yourself a series of questions. So you could ask yourself, is SEO important to me for my app? If it is, then you probably want to avoid an SBA. You can ask yourself, how often does my app need to update? If it's minute by minute, you are going to want to <clears throat> avoid an SSG, SWR, and ISR. If it's hourly, SSG should be avoided because it's really not going to be very efficient. Then you're going to ask yourself, how do you want to host it? If you have static hosting in mind, you'll avoid SSR, SWR, and ISR. And then finally, is first load performance important to you and the app? If so, you might want to avoid SSR as well as SPAs. With my case, in terms of Viewmaster, we're a content site. SEO, of course, is important to us. Uh, updates are made weekly. Static hosting is preferable. And first load performance is also important. So for us, an SSG is going to work for our use case. Alternatively, we could also employ a hybrid approach where maybe the user dashboard is an SPA, whereas our blog is ISR, et cetera, like we looked at before. All right, so that brings me to the end of the talk. If you like learning and learning view in this visual way from uh, this talk, we have a whole library like I alluded to. And right now we are running our biggest deal of the year so far with 60% off. So you can get a whole year of access to um, just about 55 view courses for all experience levels. So you can dive deeper into Nuxt, Vite, uh, Pinia, router, etc. We cover a uh, whole expansive exploration into the Vue ecosystem. And if I haven't seen you yet at my booth, I've got some free cheat sheets 
I got Nuxt ones, Pinia ones, and V-Router ones, as well as some stickers. So I'd love to meet you and say hello and uh, see you uh, around the rest of the conference. Thank you.